Hey everyone and welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Ellen Dennis and I'm the state government reporter with the Spokesman Review. Today I'm joined by State Auditor Pat McCarthy who is running for another four-year term on the November ballot. Um, I'm also joined by our podcast producer Jonathan Curley who is zooming in from Spokane, Washington in the studio. Um, Thank you so much for being here, Pat. My pleasure. Um, I guess to begin with, why don't you give us your pitch? Why are you running for re-election and why should people vote for you? Great. Well, it's my oppor- my honor to be the Washington State Auditor, and I've been this in this position for the last eight years. Um, and I will tell you that this is a noble work that we do in the State Auditor's Office. Uh, we audit all of government, all local governmental entities, uh, from a small mosquito district to King County. Uh, from we audit all uh, state agencies uh, from the smallest commission uh, to uh, DSHS. So um, Washington has a great legacy of uh, keeping uh, government accountable, uh, mainly fiscally accountable. Uh, So we do uh, financial audits. We do accountability audits, which is to make sure that uh, government is uh, following the Open Public Meetings Act and looking at their minutes and Uh, making sure that they follow all the rules and laws and procedures uh, that they are required to do. And we do performance audits, uh, which we look at the performance and trying to ensure that governments uh, um, are working as efficiently and effectively. And um, we do cybersecurity audits, which are uh, really a, a boon business for us right now because people are very concerned about Uh, being hacked, and we can provide those kinds of services and tools for local governments or state agencies to protect themselves uh, from fraudsters and uh, cyber hackers. And uh, we do something new that the state legislature asked us to do about two years ago, uh, two to three years ago, to to look at um, uh, the investigations of use of deadly force uh, at local law enforcement uh, agencies across the state of Washington. And so we've been doing those for the last two years. I would recommend any of your listeners uh, to be able to go out to our website. We have a plethora. We have a lot of information on our website. Uh, and I am proud to say it's it's pretty user friendly. I would highly recommend going into the blog section because it gives you a small paragraph. So if you want to do the deeper dive to really look at more information on that particular topic, uh, we have that available for you. We do the whistleblower program and we do frauds, um, uh, you know, um, across the state. Uh, Unfortunately, we've had some significant frauds this uh, last year in Washington. So uh, anyways, that's our book of business. And it's been my honor to do to do this work. I am uh, slated to be um, the president elect. I'm currently the president elect for the National Association of State Auditors which my goal in that capacity is really to uh, bring the good ideas that are happening across the country in this accountability field that I that I live in right now. So I have been honored to be in this position and I am looking forward uh, to seeing if the voters will give me that honor again one more time. Why don't you give us a breakdown of what your day looks like um, day to day as a state auditor currently? So um, I um, run the state auditor's office. We have about 480 employees, uh, which has been an increase since I've walked in the door. Um, and that's to do all this good work that we're doing. Uh, and uh, and we're sprinkled across the state of Washington. I like to say we have 15 offices. We have one in Spokane there. We have one in the Tri-Cities. Um, and so we have them on the east side of the mountains and we have them on the west side of the mountains. Um, so I will travel to those teams. Uh, I do that on a frequent basis uh, and meet with our different teams and different auditors located in those teams. Um, I convene meetings. I have a cabinet. Um, so I manage really the office and the office operations. I set the goals and what we're looking at right now. And one of the reasons why I decided I wanted to run for this office again is because uh, I am con- concerned, but I have also curiosity about AI and what AI can be or do, the efficiencies that it could possibly bring to the state auditor's office, while at the same time, making sure we minimize any risks that could happen. So 
I created an internal team and have worked with them. And so we have committee meetings. Um, I meet on a regular basis, not only internally with my staff, but also externally. So I, prior to the pandem pandemic, I did a lot of rotaries and Kiwanis and service clubs, uh, trying to get the message out of what uh, the state auditor's office does to educate the public uh, about the fact that government is audited a lot. Um, and they will tell you that if you ask them. Uh, but uh, I also uh, work with legislators um, uh, in, in the business that we're in. So I meet with both sides of the aisle. Uh, so Democrats and Republicans and uh, House members and senators. Uh, we also do some work with the feds. So I'm on conversations with our federal um, compliance uh, authorities at the federal level as well. So um, it's a it's a great job. It's a busy job. Um, and uh, any given day at this morning, I was just on a meeting uh, for about an hour and we'll continue. It's like one meeting after another, but it is about uh, trying to make sure that we're running the office as efficiently as we propose that other governments will offer uh, op operate their uh, governments efficiently. So earlier this summer, your office released information, I believe early July, about a big audit. I think it was record breaking. Could you talk a little bit about that investigation and what that announcement entailed? Uh, can you give me a specific title? Because we do a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me pull it up the thing real quick. Was it the Office of Administrative Hearings? Are you talking about a fraud case? Yeah, it was the big uh, credit card fraud case. I think it was the first week of July that it was announced. It. Okay, I'm um, I'm not quite sure which one that is because we've had a number of them. Um, interestingly, uh, we do fraud, like I said, across Washington State, and we have a number of our auditors that have been trained um, on um, how to be fraud investigators, um, and so we have about sixty of them as, uh, um, and they, and they really are providing information and tools for local governments or state agencies to re, be vigilant on, on making sure that they have strong internal controls, because that's what it's all about, to have strong internal controls. But the case that I, I think you're talking about was a state agency, um, not too large, but large enough, uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings. Yeah, I just um, pulled it up to just double check. And yeah, it looks like it was about 900,000 in- Right, uh, right. And that's kind of what we're seeing. We're kind of seeing that there are larger dollar amounts. So what this, um, what what the Office of Administrative Hearings, um, it had a lack of control. So for the public to understand what happened here, well, they didn't have controls over the person that was actually uh, the analyst who had control over the purchase cards. And he created a false uh, fabricated um uh, businesses um, that he was able to uh, funnel money using those purchase cards into those uh, into those businesses, and he created four of them, and he did did it over time. Uh, and um, we um, found it because I've hired a data scientist um, to really look at some of these um, governmental entities that have a large amount of data. Uh, to look at. And we looked at it over time uh, over the course of a few years. Um, and um, and a governments, if they're a certain size, will not be audited every year. They'll be audited maybe on a cycle of every three years. And that's what state law says. But at any rate, um, we um, he did a search um, and there were some anom anomalies that was uh, looked at and found in this search that he did uh, using a, a logarithm to find it. Um, and it looked at things like travel. Um, and this was during the pandemic. And so our auditors brought this to the attention of the Office of Administrative Hearings, the finance director. And it came to show that this particular um, purchase card analyst that they had was uh, stealing money. And that's what happens. It Many times it's internal folks who um, they try a little bit to begin with and then it grows. And that's what happened here at the Office of Administrative Hearings. And it really is about them having internal controls, having checks and balances, having segregation of duties and a whole host of things that can ensure that they will not put themselves in a position of having an employee take advantage of uh, the organization. 
So that was a big one. And that was almost a million dollars. And that was disheartening. And so we've had some others at local governments as well. We had one on the west side of the mountain. So we're where I'm at here um, for uh, the town of Morton. Um, and please go out to our website. You will see uh, the reports on them. They're very thorough. Um, they uh, we We publish everything. So uh, with the exception of when we do a cybersecurity audit, we find vulnerabilities in a particular governmental agency. We can't put that out onto the website because we we don't want to increase their vulnerability, of course, as one could understand that. But short of that, we put everything out on our website. So we have a lot of good information uh, for the public to take advantage of and look about their governments, see what governments they have see who they're paying taxes to, see if that government is, whether it's a park district, a school district, a library district, your county, your city, um, to see if they are managing your dollars efficiently and effectively, they're being transparent and they're being accountable. This election cycle, there has been a lot of uh, talk in the state of Washington about COVID dollars, some being lost, some being kind of spent shadily. Could you talk a little bit about your office's role in investigating that and moving forward, what you'd like voters to know? Well, I think it's really important to know that we're post auditors. So what we do is we look at that governmental entity after the year that we're looking uh, backwards towards how they handled those dollars. Um, and we knew that or what I the term I used was a tsunami of money was coming into Washington state. Some of that money came directly, like in the county of Spokane, came directly to the county from the feds. Some of it came and was funneled through, I think it's the Department of Commerce did most of it. Uh, so some of it came through the state and local governments and state agencies got those monies. Uh, I will say this, that in our review of the work that we do and auditing this, sometimes from time to time, we found that the feds weren't very clear and clarity is really important when you're talking about um, auditing and holding people accountable. You hold them accountable to the laws. Whether you like the laws or not, whether you agree with the laws, it doesn't matter. Those laws stand sacrosanct and we follow what the laws say. And in some cases, um, the laws that the feds passed uh, were not as clear or they said they gave flexibility. Well, flexibility isn't really good in our book of business. Uh, quite frankly, we need um, consistency and we need uh, to hold governments accountable. And so to some degree, there was some um, cities and counties and local entities that may have um, not spent those monies as what the Fed said they should have. But you can't come back after the fact and you send this money to a state like the state of Washington and then say, well, but we didn't want you to spend it on that. You needed to be clear up front. So those governmental entities knew how to spend that money. They gave flexibility, I think, which was kind of a difficult problem with, um, with some governments. Some governments did great. They did, uh, they spent that money appropriately, but we are looking at that. We continue to look at that. We now look at, we're in 2024. So we're looking now, we're beginning the process to look at 2023. We have looked at 2022, but all those reports, all those financial reports are, um, and if we found problems, um, they're out on our website. So I would encourage folks to go to our website. I, I like to say it's not Google but it is pretty user-friendly and you can pretty much find everything that you need. And if you can't, we have a citizen hotline. And if you have concerns, um, you go to our hotline and we will um, look and see if we need to do an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, would you say in your experience, both as auditor and, and working in Pierce County, that there has been any kind of influx of money that's uh, even paralleled or come close to the COVID money that came through in terms of like disaster management? No. Okay. I think I think the simple answer would be no. I think that was an unprecedented time, as you've heard, and people have used that term. Uh, I think it's true. Uh, you can't get billions of dollars and um, into a state and and it just doesn't happen like that. Um, and um, it was unique. Uh, I think we we in the state auditor's office, I'm proud to say, weren't caught flat-footed. So it's important for your um, 
folks that are listening, it, it's important for you to know we we continue to audit um, even when we uh, were in the uh, beginning stages of the pandemic and through it and after it. Um, so we continue to do our work. We had all of our employees, with the exception of about four, that had laptops that could work um, uh, virtually. Um, we uh, had worked virtually for that first year, and then we sub subsequently went ahead and uh, were able to work um, high, in a hybrid model. And so that's what we do today. So many times our auditors go straight to a governmental entity. They'll go to the school district or they'll go to the city and they'll look at their books. Uh, but we've been able to find some ways we can do some things virtually. And that's been a benefit. Uh, we're able to do sometimes a little more, more communication and all of that that we need to do with local governments and, and state agencies uh, as well. So our challenge during that time period was really our more of our governmental entities that had shut down uh, and they kind of closed doors and didn't give us an opportunity because we rely on government to provide us that financial information so that we can do the audit of them. Um, and um, so, um, like I said, uh, we we I think it, it worked. I, in my humble opinion, uh, government kept running um, uh, regardless of who you were. Uh, some better than others. We all uh, lamented a little bit about what happened with school districts, but I will tell you that uh, and what happened as a result, what children experienced with regards to the pandemic. Um, and um, But short of that, I think government uh, really tried to um, work through it, navigate through the difficult times of the pandemic, and I'm glad that it's in our rearview mirror. For sure. Mm -hmm. If you're re-elected, what is, in your eyes, something you anticipate being the biggest challenge for your office in the next four years? I think, um, I, I mentioned it briefly already, but I think AI, um, artificial intelligence, and, and how, we, how we implement some of the advantages it could potentially provide. Like, I'll give you an example. So, uh, we look through the minutes of a, let's say, a, a school board, um, a city council, a county council, um, local governments that have a legislative body uh, locally, um, and we look through their minutes and we do that body work, and it's very laborious, laborious work. Well, if we could get uh, AI to do that first cursory review with keywords, I think that would give our auditors an opportunity to maximize their time and being able to do more uh, actually and look at other things and be able to pinpoint some of those things that could be uh, a, a blip on the on the radar for us to look a little bit deeper and a little bit uh, stronger. So I, that's an advantage I think that AI could provide the state auditor's office at this point. But I think that, um, uh, you know, we also have to be careful about any risks that are involved because we believe in data and the state auditor's office. We believe in accuracy. We believe in the truth. And the truth is borne out through that data and the work that we do. And so we say trust, but verify. So if you're in government, we think you should trust your employees, regardless of who you are, but you need to verify um, because trust doesn't mean you get absolution from being overlooked and, and, and being overseen and, and being having internal controls and having other eyes looking at the work that you do. And so anyways, I wanna continue that work that we're doing there. Um, I also wanna to continue to work as technology takes a bigger role in the work that we do in the state auditor's office that we uh, not are, are not on the bleeding edge, but we're on the cutting edge, that we have a high-performing organization. Uh, we've received major recognitions from national organizations for the work that we've done here in Washington State, I'm proud to say. Uh, and especially if I talk about our cybersecurity work, uh, we had a number of um, agencies that were waiting in line for us to do a cybersecurity audit, where we go in and we actually technically look at all of their uh, technology within that organization. Um, so we created a program uh, called uh, Cyber Checkups, which gives uh, governments an opportunity to do a checklist to see what those vulnerabilities and what things they should be looking at uh, to be able to um, uh, forego any 
any cyber attack that they could have. Um, we do ransomware audits as well and our hospitals, our public hospitals like the work that we do because it provides us some good information for them to tighten up um, how they're managing uh, their data uh, and their and their finances as well. So it's, it's noble work, uh, it's good work. Um, the government is held accountable by another set of eyes. Uh, that's the Washington State Auditor's Office. It's a great legacy. As a Washingtonian, you should be proud of because this office was actually created in 1889 um, with the intent of our forefathers, and they were our forefathers, to say that we need an outside independent state elected office to look at what the term, term of art at the time would have been the coffers of uh, local governments and state agencies. And I'll and I usually say. If you've seen one and met one state auditor, you've met one state auditor because we all do something a little bit different. Not every state has the same construct that we have in Washington state. Uh, Ohio probably is who we're most similar to. Uh, but I wanna continue that good work. I wanna continue making sure that Washington state um, is doing everything it can to protect the public's resources. Um, and that's the good work that we do in the state auditor's office. Um. What makes us similar to Ohio? Because we do about the same book of business, if you will. So we do performance auditing. We do fi financial auditing. We do accountability auditing, per se. Uh, we look at all of governments. So they oversee all of governments. You can take like Oregon to the south of us. Um, they uh, do performance auditing and they do some auditing of some governmental entities. I can't remember if it's if it's just state government or if it's just local governments, but they don't do both. We do all of it. If you get public dollars locally, statewide or federally, you get those public dollars, we're gonna audit you. Um, and like I said, we're, excuse me, we're on a schedule of when we do those audits, but we do auditing uh, of all of government. And so Ohio is similar to us, they're bigger than us. They have 800 people that work in their um, audit shop. Um, but um, but be that as it may, we do similar work as the state of Ohio. That's interesting. Um, you mentioned that you've been doing cybersecurity audits of local government in the state. Um, of course, without, as you said, trying to like give away, like here's how to hack. Um, could you talk about some concerns you found in those or things that you'd like people to know? I think I think the key and what one of the things that we say, in my staff say and our messages is it's everybody's responsibility. It's not just your IT department. It's everyone's responsibility with the or within the organization to really, if they see something, say something. There's lots of taglines we say, uh, and they're important because it's important for everyone to take responsibility. You're part of a system. A system. We say one SAO, so we're all responsible for really ensuring that the operations are run uh, in the best interest of the public we serve. And that's true in local governments, regardless of what kind of governmental entity, whether you're a special purpose district, like a fire district, water district, school district, et cetera, um, or you're a county or city at, at the local level. So it doesn't matter. You still have a responsibility to be vigilant and, and to really make sure that you are protecting those resources and that data, the personal data of the citizens that you serve. Because in government, we have access to personal information, it's true. Um, and so we need to protect that. Well, at the same time, I think government is being pushed and rightfully so to be able to be as transparent, to let you see what you need to see about your own is your own things uh, within the governmental entity. So um, you wanna be able to get your birth certificate. You wanna be able to get that information that's particular to you, uh, but do you want everything like that on the website? So it's incumbent upon us to find that sweet spot of being, uh, ensuring that transparency is alive and well, um, but you also have to be accountable. So you have to find that sweet spot. And that's what we would do. Uh, and we're vigilant about it in the state auditor's office. Okay. Um, I guess my last question for you is, what would you say sets you apart from your opponent in this race? Um, 
I think key would be understanding what the state auditor's office does, um, what the work that we do and our responsibilities, our role and responsibilities to the citizens of Washington state. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, it, uh, it's an office where you need to manage a lot of people. And I think I have the skills and ability I've proven uh, that I know how to run um, an agency like ours. It's not huge like DSHS, but it is a good size with 480 employees. Um, and not to take that lightly, uh, it's important to note that I have no agenda other than ensuring that uh, the citizens of Washington state uh, have us uh, be that um, watchdog of government and that we ensure that they are doing the right thing, uh, but at the same time uh, being constructive so that we can raise the trust in government. Uh, I believe in government. I believe we do more good in government than we don't, but it is this separate set of eyes that holds government accountable, uh, holds government to a high standard of transparency and holds government uh, to uh, a, the willingness and the ability to be as efficient as possible with the tax dollars we're given. So I think we're different in many ways, but those would probably be the most significant this job is an important job. It has important roles and responsibilities, and it's important to note that. Well, Pat, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me today um, on behalf of the Spokesman Review and voters. We're so appreciative of your taking the time. Um, well, it's my pleasure. It's always fun to talk about my office. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, ballots will be mailed out in mid-October and election day is November 5th, so make sure to go out there and vote. Agreed.